Up until now, our ontological analysis has been static. In other words, we haven't been considering the effect of time. But time is the ultimate ontological constraint. In the form of death, it delimits the span of our life, our existence. And even while we are alive, the qualities and possibilities of the current time limit what we can do, what's possible for us. And time provides the ultimate object of care, our death. So the phenomenological process regarding death discloses the relation of care with death, that death is the thing we should care about the most. And that's where our anxiety is actually coming from. Our anxiety is not exactly objectless, but then again, it's an object that has very special qualities, as we will see in the current analysis. In our phenomenological process, the analysis of inauthenticity comes first, because that's where we find ourselves thrown. The entire world is inauthentic, and we have been driven by that inauthenticity, and we have also become inauthentic. So we find ourselves in an inauthentic condition, and to get to authenticity, we have to perform some kind of process. And of course, that is our process of phenomenological self-reflection. When we say temporality, we mean being in time. And in the beginning, our being in time is going to be in terms of the moment, but ultimately it has to expand to embrace our entire existence, including death. Authenticity, then, begins from being authentic about our inauthenticity, because in the beginning, that's all we've got. We don't have anything that's authentic, because the way we wound up being was determined by outside forces, outside influences, idle talk, being in the world, care, and so on. But we have to become aware of our being in totality. In other words, if we want to be successful, we have to have access to our full energy, our full intelligence, our full attention. And to gather all these things together, we have to be aware of all sides of our being, beginning with the inauthentic, and gradually approaching the authentic being, that part of our being that is unique and that no one can imitate. Look up Articulate. A good dictionary you should do, but if you want to research the philosophical background, that would be better. A human being in the full sense of the term includes the process of ontological inquiry. What is our being? How are we being? How can we improve our being? In ordinary life, in being in the world, very few people take up this inquiry. And that means they are not human beings in the full sense of the term. When we say the implication of a static concept, we mean its realization in time. For example, we might say, uh, the price of gold is such and such today. But that's a static concept, and it doesn't give us much information to go on. But when we graph the price of gold over a long period of time, we get all kinds of information out of it. Uh, we can see if it has any cycles, if it has any periodic or seasonal variations. We can see its response to other market factors and so on. So, if being in the world as a static concept is care, then being in time is authenticity. In other words, there's a lot more information in the dynamic, temporalized concept of being than there is in the static one. Care is something that we can define in a moment. But authenticity requires time. We measure authenticity by how much integrity a person has, 
how well they uh, can honor their word. And that takes time. A person has to give their word, then we have to see if they keep their word, and if they don't keep their word, how are they dealing with that? Are they honoring their word? Are they making up the difference to the people that they let down, and so forth? Authenticity is a temporal concept. Care is a static concept. In the context of authenticity, guilt means diminished integrity. How much integrity does a person have? They gave their word. Did they keep it? Did they honor it? How much integrity do they have? If they have full integrity means they're a human being in the full sense of the term, and that's a very big thing. Conscience will be explored extensively in part two, the call of the friend. Uncanniness, uh, if you didn't look it up before, you should look it up now. It provides a context for the discussion of death, because uncanniness means the strangeness of being in the world, the fact that we're not really at home in the world. We feel like strangers in a strange land in this world, because this is not really our home. Yet we can be very successful here, very effective, if we hold our activities in the context of uncanniness. The apparent tension between the static and dynamic models is simply a presentational artifact. It's simply a limitation of our linear language. When we put things in prose, we have to put them in a linear sequence. Uh, but as you go around and around, listen to these videos and study them again and again, you will see that actually all of these concepts exist simultaneously and interpenetrate one another. In being in the world, we're always projecting into the future, planning, thinking which is better to do this or that, looking over the different possibilities of life and choosing the one that we will be able to actualize letting the rest go. So we're actually incomplete and our life is at complete whole only when we die. So grasping the meaning of our being as a whole automatically invokes the topic of death. It's not like we like to talk about death. Death is a difficult topic for everyone. But if we're going to understand our being as a whole, if we want to become all that we can be to be a success in this world, we have to grasp this topic of death. But this gives us a problem. If we are using the phenomenological method, does that mean, does death mean that we can never grasp the totality of our being? Do we have to wait until we die before we can have a complete view of our being? It's a huge problem, and we're going to devote most of this discussion in this video to this problem. One of the features of discussing the topic of being, and one of the reasons why people find it uncomfortable to discuss being and try to avoid it, is that talking about being automatically invokes its dialectic, non-being or death. Uh, this makes people uncomfortable, and uh, rightly so, because it's our ultimate problem. But we have to deal with these uncomfortable topics to get a complete grasp of the subject of being. And if we don't do that, we're not being human beings in the full sense of the term. The problem is that by the time we die, by the time the body actually dies, we're already gone. We've gone someplace else. We can talk about that where we go later on. Right now, we're still trying to understand where we are. So how can phenomenology investigate death? Because nobody actually experiences death. They only experience dying, approaching death. When death comes, we're already gone.
So we don't like to talk about death, and we don't like to talk about being, because being, the topic of being, invokes the topic of death. But that trivializes our life. It makes our life nothing more than a succession of events determined by the other, uh, where we get to choose between different forms of gratification, different forms of work, <clears throat> different forms of uh, public beingness that's determined by someone else. And we never approach our own most concerns. Our projectiveness hides our death by absorbing us in the other. And it also hides our real being. Uh, we can't have it both ways. We can't hide the subject of death and avoid hiding the subject of our real being. We're going to hide both of them together. They both are part of the same thing, being and nothingness, existence and non-existence. So that dialectic uh, is hidden or confronted together. And the problem is that we set aside our real concerns, the things that really matter to us, the things we really care about, because we care about the claims of the other. The other says, you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to have a job. You got to wear a suit. You got to do that. Got to get married. Got to go here. Got to watch TV. Got to stay con uh, current with the news and so on. So many things that the other seems to care about. But actually, we don't care about them at all. Our real concern is, how can we become all that we can really be? So we're trying to grasp our life, our human beingness, in its totality. But death makes it very difficult to grasp our being in its totality. Yet we cannot grasp another's life in its totality because we're not them. Uh, we don't die their death. We don't eat their meals. We don't live their lives. We are living our own lives. So how do we grasp our life in, the, in its totality. This is a problem for the phenomenological method. We use, or maybe I should say we misuse, traditional religious functions to continue to be with the dead person. And of course, we're being with them as being not here, being absent, being dead. So it's not very satisfying. But the real meaning of these uh, rituals and observances is, of course, to uh, comfort ourselves. We do find our meaning in this life by viewing it in the context of death, but not the generalized context of death, not the death that happens to somebody else, not the concept of death, not the abstraction of death, but the fact that our death is a definite possibility at every moment. When we view our life in the context of death, it acquires a special meaning. It becomes very distinct. And when we view our existence in the context of non-existence is the only time that it acquires its real significance. So thinking about another person's life is a third-person point of view. It's from the stands, not in the field, hmm? not as lived experience. So it doesn't count as phenomenological inquiry. It's more like philosophical speculation about death or life. So we have to think about our life from our point of view, and we have to think about death from our point of view. So thinking about another's life as a whole, or thinking about another person's death, cannot really help us understand our life as a whole. Unless, of course, it inspires us to contemplate the certainty of our own death. So of all the possibilities of our life, Death is the most personal possibility. It's our death is the thing that nobody else can have, nobody else can do. Our death cannot belong to anybody else. It's non-transferable, non-relational. 
but what is its existential meaning? In other words, what is its significance in our phenomenological process? How do we relate to death as an ever-present possibility that can happen at any moment, but actually we never get to experience it? because it always remains just a possibility, and by the time it actually happens, we're already gone. Death renders the claims of the world upon us utterly void. It really shows up the claims of the other for what they are. Death shows us that the things that really matter to us are those things that are wholly and completely our own, that are non-relational, non-transferable to any other person. Therefore, ordinary analogies using material similes are impotent to model death. Death is a unique thing, a unique phenomenon, there's nothing else like it in our experience. So we can't use ordinary metaphors to model death because death annihilates everything of our being in the world. In the face of death, being in the world is reduced to utter insignificance. Thus, our greatest fear should be to die without discovering our authentic being. Most people die like that, without discovering their authentic being. Most people die while still absorbed in the claims and activities of the world, while still trying to fulfill the possibilities offered to them by the other, without discovering their unique authentic possibilities. But we can't fulfill our real purpose in life if we are always absorbed in the claims of the world. The world has unlimited claims, obligations, and possibilities to offer us. The world can absorb our entire time, energy, and attention without any trouble at all. So if we are going to find our real selves, if we are going to collect the different pieces of our being that are scattered all over the world, and concentrate them to attain our real state of being, then we are going to have to become detached from the claims of the world. In other words, we're going to have to stop caring about them. And the way to do that is to start caring about the fact that we are definitely going to die. We can't do it all. We have to pick one possibility out of all the possibilities in any situation. The unchosen possibilities in every situation are lost forever. We can never get them back. We can never go back in time and recover one of the possibilities that we did not choose. So if we choose for others, if we choose for the world and not for ourselves, that possibility of authentic being in that moment is lost forever. In that situation, we can't go back and remedy it and say, no, actually, I meant to be my authentic being. We can't do it. So the problem is we are attached to the unfulfilled possibilities because we care about them. We care. We think, oh, I let that one go. I couldn't be uh, what I wanted to be to please that person, or I couldn't be the kind of being that I saw in that ad or in that movie, in that uh, way of looking at life that I wanted to show to others uh, because of my ego or my image or whatever. Yeah? We're attached to those unfulfilled possibilities, and we want to keep them around. But we can't, because time irrevocably tears them from our grasp. So our own death can be experienced only as a possibility. It's always a possibility, a possibility that is always there but never comes. Because, as we mentioned, by the time you actually die, you're already gone. So death is an impossible possibility. 
We know it's going to happen. It could happen at any moment, but it never actually happens to any of us. We don't experience it. Uh, by the time death comes, we're already gone. So our existence becomes impossible. Death makes our existence impossible, and it's definitely a possibility. Therefore, death is the impossible possibility of our possible impossibility. The fact that death is irrevocably personal, our own most possibility, the ever-present possibility that is born along with our birth, but it's a possibility that never arrives within our experience. Death is non-relational. Not only is it non-transferable and cannot be experienced in terms of a third person's death, but it's non-relational. It destroys all claims of the other on us. When death comes, the business of the world is finished. And it is inevitable. It will definitely happen. But we don't ever get to experience it. Therefore, one of the qualities of authentic being is an awareness of death as always impending. Something that can happen at any moment. If we think of death like this, like anxiety, uh, this awareness throws us back on ourselves. We become aware of the significance of our choices in every moment. We uh, hold death in an authentic way to motivate ourselves to complete our individual possibilities, those possibilities that only we can choose. Huh? No uh, anybody person can choose. Anybody can go down to the store and buy stuff. Anybody can watch TV. But nobody else can sing my song. Nobody else can make love like I do. Nobody else can come up with a way of living that no one else can imitate. Only the authentic being. There's a nice quote. The prospect of being hanged focuses the mind wonderfully by Samuel Johnson. He's talking about awareness of death and how it focuses the mind on the real self, the authentic being. So the phenomenological approach to death is only as a possibility, a possibility nevertheless that could become actualized at any moment. So if we hold death in this way, then it becomes a part of our phenomenological analysis, our phenomenological approach to living. When we hold death as a possibility, it puts everything in our existence into its proper perspective. It gives it its proper meaning. In other words, it provides a context that gives a view of our life as a whole. And that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to get some way of grasping our life as a whole from beginning to end in its completeness. And in the beginning, death seemed to be an obstacle to that because, as we've discussed extensively, it's a possibility that we never get to experience. So how do we experience our life as a whole in the moment? Well, we accept a context that gives our life as a whole a meaning in the moment, and that is the possibility of death. So death, instead of being an obstacle to phenomenological inquiry into the meaning of our whole being, actually becomes the means of grasping our whole being. Death is the most non-relational possibility. It belongs to us alone. Nobody else can die our death. It's non-transferable. And we cannot experience another's death. We cannot even experience our own death. So it's only a possibility. Death held as a possibility, though, puts us alone at cause over our choices. It's very clear that only we can choose. 
how we are going to live our lives. Nobody else can do that for us. And nobody else can um, distinguish those choices that are ours alone and that could not belong to anybody else. It highlights that our stories about the other being at cause are inauthentic. The other is not at cause, as we discussed in the previous section on skepticism. If we accept the choices and the meanings given by the other, it means that we have internalized them and we are using them to make our choices. But we don't have to do that. We have another choice. We can be authentic. We can choose for ourselves. And that is the advantage that holding death as a possibility gives to us. So the root of all our inauthenticity is hiding our death from ourselves, forgetting about this possibility, forgetting about the certainty of death, and making believe that we're never going to die, taking up the claims of the other as our real life, which of course it's not, and hiding, using them to screen our awareness of death from our consciousness. And remember, death is the impossible possibility of our possible impossibility. So it seems to be a contradiction in terms. How can we hold death as an existential possibility when it's actually not an existential possibility at all? Uh, it's only always a possibility. It's never an actuality in our existence. So the uh, slide ends with a question. How can we gain phenomenological access to death? And the hint of the answer is that a context is not necessarily a possibility that can be actualized, but it influences the meaning of our experience by allowing us to hold it in a certain way. In other words, if we hold our existence in the context of non-existence, it gives our existence a depth of meaning that's unobtainable in any other way. So death is unlike any other existential possibility in the sense that it can never become existential. And this means that the difference between death and other possibilities is that death is an ontic rather than an ontological possibility. Remember, ontic refers to what can be, what is possible, and ontological refers to what is, what is experienced in life. Inevitability of death is the essential context for our projectiveness. In other words, we're looking forward to death and that is the source of our anxiety. Our anxiety is then projected on other possibilities to distract us from the certainty of death. But death is our most genuine, inevitable, and own most possibility. And if we hold it like that, it reveals a profound depth of meaning in our life that we cannot become aware of in any other way because it allows us to hold and view our life as a whole in the knowledge that it is finite, that it is going to end, and that we have only a limited amount of time to actualize our authentic possibilities. Diagram the ontological triple of impending death. You can use our triple diagram or the standard RDF triple. Get completely clear that your death is going to happen. What shows up for you in that context? Contemplate your death as a possibility that could happen at any moment. How does that influence your values, your decisions? Consider your existence in the context of non-existence, death. How does that change your view of your life as a whole? Confront a source or object of anxiety for you. Now hold it in the context of death. How does it change for you? 
What would you do if you knew you were going to die in a year, a month, tomorrow,